So this is the project. It's actually a pediment above a doorway, but it's a Queen Anne bonnet top style scroll board and gooseneck molding. Some people call it swan neck molding. Okay, so I've taken and flush trimmed a uh, straight edge along this to, to trim it off, smooth it out for glue up. And I've circled a piece off my template with the piece of my cutout. I'm going to bandsaw around that. I'll probably cut that on the miter saw and then I'll uh, glue it straight straight against this edge here. And again, it will be hidden. Thank God it didn't blow out somewhere else. Okay, this morning I've been doing a little light rasping. Um, held a straight edge up to this piece right here behind it. That's what a piece of plywood is for right here, just to kind of line it up and try to get a little flatter. And I'm kind of rasping around some of the curves. Notice that this curve has is a lot rougher cut than the other side. The other side seemed to be a lot smoother cut. Something to do with technique. There's some deeper cuts in here that not quite responding to the rasp. I'm going to take it back to the drum sander and sand that out. But for these areas up in here, I've been little tight areas. I've been using the rasp. Use a flat side on the round part here. Use a curved side on the curve in here. And I'm going to hold the template back up to that. This is a piece I had to glue on there again. That'll be hidden eventually, but I w there will be a hole right through the center of this to hold on the uh, rosette block. I, you know, my piece I made before, I made this smaller um, than the rosette block, and it was hidden behind it. And so I'm not going to do too much work on this right now, trying to smooth it off, because it, it may end up being the same process if it doesn't line up well with the rosette block and the gooseneck molding. And I'm going to go ahead and smooth the outer parts down a little bit with this flexible plastic piece that has sandpaper on it before I start drawing my curve for the gooseneck molding. Got this piece in the mail yesterday. Another, it's like my third piece trying to match up the right size for the project. And I don't know, we may go with it. We'll see toward the end, get a little closer. I'm thinking that uh, someday we're going to have the one hour drone delivery to the workshop door and for parts and things and that's going to be kind of nice for woodworkers especially if you're like missing a router bit or something it doesn't hold you up too long i'm sure that's coming within our lifetime just a matter of time of course with trees in the backyard that could be a problem okay so i'm uh taking and chiseling some of the little corners that you can't quite get into i guess i could have probably rasped just about all the way in there but i'm just starting to chisel out uh, I need a nice sharp chisel for that. Um, so I'm starting to go for these corners here and then I'll go here and here. Yeah, I took my template back on and drew some lines and found out this piece I glued on of course was a little too big so work on that later too. And I did take it to the drum sander briefly and did a little bit inside but I can still see some um, cuts here in the wood that we'll have to work on. So now some little tedious work right now before I uh, move on to draw my template. This is the piece of plastic sanding uh, strip that I'd shown earlier. You know, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is this length is just slightly shorter than the sandpaper is wide, so when you can cut pieces, you can uh, apply it with a little bit overhang, which is a good, which is good for the curve, the outer curve here. Yeah, it's a little tight for the inner curve radius. I guess you'd need a little thinner plastic for that. I remember one time when I went to a uh, Rob Kosman class on dovetail cutting, and he said that there was only two people in his classes ever that had the chisels sharpened correctly. You should see a mirror finish on there. I was not one of them. I had some new chisels, that these ones actually, that were out of the factory box, and they didn't have the mirror finish on there. But uh, that's how you tell sharp chisels. And if you're ever in Rob Kosman's class for dovetail cutting, make sure that you get them sharpened really well ahead of time. Maybe you can be the third person, though I'm sure he's had a few since that time. I might just take another class just so I can show up with some sh really sharp chisels. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm getting ready to bandsaw out an outer edge I can use to draw the gooseneck molding from. Used a piece of uh, thin, I guess probably quarter inch hardbacker board. And I push this up toward the 
top just to save extra material for later because this is the only piece I need. Do a real thick line, make sure you go over and over and over because it's a dark board. You want to have a real good pencil line for bandsawing that out. And the other thing, make sure you do is put X's along the outside so I know to keep the bandsaw on the outer edge and then I'll take it over the drum sander and bring it down to the corner. But this is just to use as a guide. I'm supposed to use a wheel here to stay 90 degrees, though I'll see if I really need that. So you need to, a little edge that'll be sticking up above your piece to draw that from. So again, the X's are very important so you know which side of the line to cut on, especially when you're doing these forms that you could actually get mixed up on which curve and you want to stay outside there. So real dark line, lots of X's. This is going to be a, a template to draw the gooseneck molding piece off of. A template to make a template, I suppose. <coughs> Okay, so I'm getting ready to scribe a template for the gooseneck moldings. I cut this piece out and on the bandsaw and then sanded it down to fit the curve. It doesn't have to be exact. The reason I need that is I need to run a wheel along this edge to drop it down the distance from here to here for the gooseneck molding. They say you can't just trace a line along here. Can't, uh, you certainly can't use this bin because the bin down here on the lower edge is going to be the one you're cutting out or, or referencing off of. And you need to really have that the exact distance. They say not to use a compass like this because they're afraid you can't keep it at a right angle all the way down the bin. So you're supposed to use a little wheel with a hole in it. Now to make the wheel, first thing I had to figure out how, how big does the wheel have to be. Well, my piece of molding I'm going to make is two and a quarter wide and it's going to sit up proud of the top edge here about a quarter inch. Now I think a lot of people just set it an eighth inch above. That's about the width of the uh, bending board you're going to put on here. But with the bending board applied to the top here that, that bends around and on the scroll board with a few nails in there I'm afraid it might show above this top edge if it's only an eighth inch since the wood's an eighth inch that I'm going to put on here to bend it over there. So I'm going to put about a quarter inch. If it sits a little proud, i got a ridge fine. That's fine with me. Um, so then, since this is two and a quarter wide, I'm going to need a two inch circle. How to make the circle? Well, there's lots of ways to make circles. I guess if you're going to make a lot of circles, you should probably make a bandsaw jig to cut circles. Since I'm not making a lot of circles, I'm going to use the scary bit on the drill press this, which I've measured from the center of the drill bit to the edge here, about two inches. And again, that's how big I'm going to make my circle. Um, so I'll run the two inches off, two inch wheel off this. I'll show you that later. The other ways you could do it, a router uh, template for circle cutting. But the problem with this, a lot of these, they're not going to get small enough. I mean, this one's seven inches is the smallest circle. I would need a four inch uh, diameter, two inch radius. So that's not going to work for me. Um, so you've got bandsaw. I mean, you could turn one on the lathe, but that would, you know, that's a big piece of board to get a four inch round uh, s section and then slice off and use for a wheel. So probably if you do a lot, again, bandsaw jigs, they can, you can go online and find those people show you on YouTube how to make bandsaw jigs to run along there and cut circles. But for me, the quickest, easiest, just going to sit this in the drill press and spin it around and hope it doesn't fly off and go through a window or worse. I might have to hide behind a board when I use it or something. I wish I had a bulletproof vest to wear when I'm doing this. Anyway, so <clears throat> we'll see how that works out. So this is the setup I used. I clamped a piece of hardy backer board onto a scrap superficial piece and clamped it good to the board below it and to the uh, table. Uh, one thing I found out when I cut this, I'd measured from the inside to the middle of the bit as two inches because I didn't know if that inside was going to cut all the way through straight down, but it turned out that it popped out on the outer edge. So I should have measured from the outer edge. So I'm going to re-adjust this here and do a new hole from the outer edge two inches to the middle of the bit because right now it's going from this inner beveled part. That beveled part didn't cut all the way through. It actually drew this circle up. I just pushed it back down, but it drew it up as I went through the hardy backer board and it made it too too long from here to here is about two and a quarter. So I'll adjust, I'll adjust it and do it again. I'm going to uh, 
go ahead and cut another circle. I figured out this actually two and a quarter one might work if I have to draw off the bottom edge of the other one to make it two and a quarter wide eventually to make the top edge of the gooseneck. But for now I'm going to try to do the two inch. These clamps, by the way, it's called click clamp. I don't know if you can see it. I love these clamps. Um, I think they're sometimes a little bit unwieldy as far as they, they get in the way as far as the size of them, but they clamp down real nice. So here we go. It wasn't as scary as I remember this bit, this big bit spinning around. And there it is. Okay, well. I decided that probably this hardy backer board wasn't the best thing to cut it out of. Probably would have been better to use it out of a thin piece of plywood. It just doesn't sand up real well. I actually just took it and ran it along a sander without turning the sander on and just spun it with my hand to try to get it and then frayed it flat. But I think it would, plywood would have been better choice for the disc here. There's going to be a little bit of offset because the pencil is not going to fit. It's too deep so it's, it's going to not be right in the middle it's going to be up in this off the one side so it's going to be a few millimeters off not a big deal for me I did find a different jig to cut uh, circles on the router here that will do one to seven inches small circles uh, I was found it was hanging on the wall but it probably would have taken longer to set up the router and the base and everything than just to put that in the drill press the circle cutting drill press jig but they do have these that are you can do one to seven inch they circle cutter on my drill press does one to six inches. So I'm going to draw the curve now along here. I'm going to offset. I try it would be best to go past the ends on either end here to give yourself extra for routing. You never want to end right where the cut is because it'll bit might wander off a little bit. So I'm just going to set up here put the, on the inside of the some people use washer like a, a metal washer for this but again I don't have any washers that are this big so I'm going to put it on the inside of the circle just trace it along it's keeping it 90 degrees to the curve that's the important part last part might have snuck under there a little bit let's see yeah probably should have clamped down this end a little better kind of snuck under the edge but the rest of it looks pretty good. I'm going to run it back another time, make it a little darker. And I'll probably still have to extend it out past the ends. Now this is the bottom part of the gooseneck molding. This is this is the curve that'll be the router will be feeding off the template. But I'm going to need to go back up now. And since there's a quarter inch overhang, I'm going to use my other circle, the two and a quarter one, to redraw off of this line. Which is a lot of cutting back and forth it seems like. Some people just take a uh, just just take a scribe scribe a compass and take the compass and just try to hold it about 90 degrees without you know if you tilt it a little bit one way or the other though it's going to be off. So some people will try to just keep it 90 degrees or perpendicular to this edge here. That will take a very steady hand and I suppose I've done the last one I made I did that I just used a compass I didn't use a wheel. Wheel's probably better, but again, it's more time consuming. When you go back up again, I'm going to have to cut another curve and, and use the wheel off of that. It's, uh, so I need to kind of put what I'm going to X out. I'm going to take this edge and bandsaw along here and save the lower portion. Then I'll have to use this to draw on another template to the two and, two and a quarter inch circle. After cutting about five of these circles, I've decided to do a little experiment. What I found when I'm cutting my circles, I put a little mark here, which is right here in the center of the hole, and measure it from the tin place and found it was falling short because of this hole in the middle. The pencil lead's on the inside edge and it, could, it made it up to actually about a quarter inch shorter where I wanted to be. So I kept cutting progressively big circles, ended up with about five of them. By the time I got the width, I actually overshot it a little bit. That'll give me some room for sanding and cutting in case I cross over the line a little bit of sand it back down. Make sure when you're doing your templates, this is my final one right here. 
for the gooseneck, make sure you label everything which lower edge and what's upper edge because it's easy to get lost when you're going back and forth so many times. So I decided to do a little experiment to see if these wheels are really needed. So what I did is I took my compass here. First I took the wheel, made a little mark with made a little mark with the lead line here, lead pencil, and then I measured my compass off of that. And then I ran it along ran it along the molding here with a pencil line. Then I took a white pen and put it in the wheel here and ran it along. As you can see, you know, obviously I was set a little bit wide on my measure for the white versus the lead line, but the lead line's done with this compass and it is right on. So I was able to hold it at 90 degrees. You know, I was able to hold it perpendicular to the curve the whole way and I went pretty fast. I wasn't really going slow and trying to keep it from slightly varying a little bit or not. So I'm thinking in, in the future that this is good enough. You don't have to cut all these circles and, and all these templates and back and forth. You could run the pin along the outer edge here and, and draw it. And this is what I used for my last one and it worked, but I never did it against the circles. Now I'm thinking these circles might be a waste of time. I mean, to get them exactly right with the holes a problem. Maybe a router would be better because you wouldn't have the hole in the center. Well, I guess you'd still have to center it though, wouldn't you? With the pin. Yeah, the pin hole. You would still have the pin hole, which would, which would cause a problem because of the offset, the width of that, and how deep your pencil lead is, and how your pencil lead's ground, how wide, you know, how steep the slope is, is going to vary it too on the measurements. So I'm thinking maybe this this is good enough and you don't need all these wheels. I just marked uh, how much overlap, how much proud of the top edge I'm going to be. I put a line along the back of my template here, making sure that I was on the upper edge, which is labeled up, upper part, upper edge. So I set it off. Maybe I'm a little bit around a quarter inch. Again, a lot of people just do an eighth inch. If you want to be down flush where your board is, that's fine. I don't mind having a little ridge sitting a little higher. So I've offset this with my compass. Just ran it right along this, right along the edge here. Um, and it worked quite fine. Stayed even. Ran the pin on down below the surface there. And so then it'll let me clamp it on this edge here the template and look at it from behind and then start to mark off where the ends are and put the rosette in. So I took my template and just put it on with a few clamps here and uh, do reference on the back side. I ran a, about a quarter inch reveal right here uh, with my scribe all the way down and just set that on my curve. I'm trying to line up the rosette block. It's not very easy. What I did to draw this cutout, which I'm going to use right here, that line, I don't know if you can see it there, is I just held my sanding flexible strip up into this area and bent it around there. And then so it had a little lip on it and then set my cylinder in there and just drew a line across the top. I know my Scroll my scroll board backer is a little bigger than my my uh, eventual rosette to block that I'm going to use, so that'll be good. I think I'm just going to sand it down afterwards and and shape it to the edges here. I might need to chisel out a little bit here and and sand this around here to kind of make it meet on the back side. If it's a little smaller, again, I'm not worried if if the scroll board part of the rosette. I'm going to screw through the center of that. If that's a little smaller than my cylinder, that's fine. I'm going to chop this off on the miter saw and then put the molding on the front. There's there's probably better ways to do. I guess some people would have marked the center when they first scribed this circle. And you could do it on a piece of paper and put your compass in there and get the center and or do use a center finder and mark it there and then scribe it with a but I, I don't know, to me this is a little irregular this piece and it's a little bigger and it's going to need to be sanded down afterwards. So that's just how I'm doing it. We'll see if it works out. I've switched this board. I drew another reveal right along. Don't know if you can see that. It's kind of dark. Um, 
This is a Friday night at 1030. There's another scribe line on the front that equals the one on the back, the same distance, about a quarter. And so when I flip it over to use on the left side, it should be the same. I did try it on there earlier. It did fit. It followed the curve quite well. Since I used a half template and used it on both sides, it should be the same. So um, that's going to work for the other side. I'll have to flip it over and just keep track of the pieces. So today I went out and got a big sheet of MDF to use as a template. I was surprised the big box stores didn't have the smaller sheets or the planks anymore. I had to buy a 4 by 8 sheet and have it cut down. It was about $25 for the MDF material. I think I like that a little better than this particle board that I used last time. The particle board seems to show kerf marks a little bit more and a little bit of tear out there you can see right there. Uh, but it also shows kerf marks more. It's a little harder to get out. So I'm going to use MDF for my template. But yeah, it was about 25 bucks for a 4 by 8 sheet. Um, and I had them cut it up into thirds so I could fit it in the vehicle and get it back. So I'm trying to figure out how much of my template on the return I need. These are, these are my, my gooseneck molding pieces coming in. And they're about, again, going to be one and three quarters wide. So when I wrap them around this corner down here, it's going to come around and back this direction because there's going to be a little bit of about an eight inch um, box coming back here. So when I wrap them around, you're going to have to go past it to kind of miter it out. I don't know if I can show that on this, but it would kind of, it would be angled out like that. So there's going to be extra um, routing you're going to need for this gooseneck molding. You can't stop right at the line there. You have to continue it past so it can angle out and miter with the wraparound piece. So to do that, uh, before I'm going to try to cut down this, this longer template right here, this front template. I'm going to try to cut this off on some ends and at the other end so I can save some of my board feet when I'm routing it. But I'm certainly going to go over on both sides because even on this side up here, because you never want to end where you're routing a piece right at the end of the work or you could get chip out, tear out, round off corners, all kinds of problems. So I got it clamped back up there and I'm getting ready to shorten this template basically. So I just drew a picture here and drew how wide it was and figured out it's going to take another inch and seven eighths on the end here. An inch and seven eighths past where it cut off to angle out to miter. So I'll make sure I have plenty past that too, past the one and seven eighths. <clears throat> I'm going ahead and marking my template now to route off for the gooseneck molding. And although I drew one line right on the edge, I'm drawing a second line just a little bit further out from it to bandsaw, because I like to bandsaw right along the line, and that'll leave me a little bit to sand down. So it just gives me another guide to have two lines running parallel. So I'm always trying to do it freehand with a bandsaw. It wanders more than if I have a second line to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and just finish, finish scribing a bandsaw line outside the template, but it's really just for my own preference and it's a little far out. But that's as close as I could get the compass to it. We'll see. Maybe I'll go on the inner part of that. I moved my pattern over a little bit um, to the left here because I wanted to extend the template past where the material will be. I always want to start your router bit bearing on a free edge of template before you cut straight into the wood. Less chance of ripping out, chipping out wood. So I moved it over. That's what getting a lot of use today out of the eraser. Um, so I moved over here and I extended lines past the end. So I'll have a little extra template I can start the router bit on and I can end it on. And again, I've got that double line just a bandsaw outside the, the template edge. And then I'll stick this on with double stick tape and flush trim it with this piece here and then I'll have to reverse it for the other side for the other the other half of the uh, scroll board. Well yeah there's another mistake. I actually have already trimmed back on this template not all the way back to where I'll be cutting it eventually and then I thought I could make it longer here to feed into the wood underneath it, but then I realized, no, I'm templating off of this piece, so actually this piece should be a little bit longer than the template I'm going to do for the router to, to start the feed, so I'm going to readjust here a little bit. Okay, so there's another mistake. 
for some reason the bit started cutting in it wasn't didn't really look high or low to me I might have just been smashing in the hardy backer board I think this this uh, hardy backer board is too thin to use for a template I'm gonna go back and just use my back line here and then scribe with my fast cap AccuScribe there's a little plug for them and make a new template out of a thicker uh, MDF and start this hardy backer board because this stuff is just not template and routing for me it's pushing in against the bearing or something and cutting in too deep. First I thought it was riding a little high and starting to cut in. I'm not quite sure because I keep looking at the uh, bearing and it looks okay. But uh, it frays if it catches the edge of it. So what I'm going to do is just go back and make another template here. And I'll use this back line to scribe and then I'll just take my other scribe to scribe the front line. I'll save a lot of time. No more wheels. <clears throat> Learn my lesson. Okay, so I've whipped up a new template here and uh, I'm going to use the MDF again making a template to make a template, but I need to make a bottom I mean a left and a right side for the scroll board So I'm going to go ahead and give this a try. I never did figure out what exactly happened with the hardy backer board I don't know if the, the bearing Kind of just dented into it or got caught between there was two double bearings I think or it rode up a little bit it seemed pretty tight in the machine and everything but anyway, I'm thinking the material is just kind of defective and, and too soft. Hopefully this MDF is a little wider too, and I've got a half inch shank bit in there to get a little better grip on it. So here we go. <clears throat> I just finished band sawing the uh, one left side of the piece here and again having these double lines is very useful so I can follow the outside line leave this much material to route off later in case the blades a little tilted one way or the other you probably want to leave a little extra to get the router will be straight up perpendicular to the uh, router shaper tabletop get a cleaner cut. Of course with this the bottom edge is going to be cut off so even if it's angled it's probably not going to matter a whole lot. There's a little bit of an angle. So one thing I found while band sawing this is that uh, the my skills are not to that of somebody who band saws every day so I tend to kind of wander left and right and I kind of compare that to oversteering when you're first learning how to drive and you're doing curves you tend to compensate going around the turf, start and turn left to right. So how do you compensate for that? Well, you just go real slow. If you're sitting in your driveway and you're oversteering, you're not going to go off the driveway if you're not moving, but if you are barely moving, but if you're going 60 miles an hour and you oversteer, you're going to cut across your line, which is what you don't want to do. So I went really slow along my second line here, and I went from one end and met, met at the other end, and you can probably see where I met there because I didn't want to get too far off the table, the bandsaw table, so I would kind of do one half and then do the other half coming from the opposite end. So now it's time to go ahead and take care of the second part. And again, I'm going to move real slow along that double line in case I oversteer one way or the other. For the flush trim along the edge of the board, I'm going to use an up spiral router bit. Um, this router bit up spiral is named after orientation from an overhead router so it moves the chips up toward the base of the router when you're routing overhead. Up spiral advantage is gives you a clean cut and it sucks down 
the piece toward the shaper table. Now it's giving a very nice clean cut, but it has a potential to tear out that bottom corner as it's pulling chips down along the edge. But that bottom corner, if I do tear out, is going to be removed eventually because it's going to be right in this area where my thumb is. So I'm not too concerned about any tear out from this, though certainly I think it'll do a much better job than a flush trim bit with just carbide straight cutters or even ang slightly angled ones. How do you tell it's a up spiral bit? Well, you're supposed to look at the right side of the blade and see that it's that it's winding up or you can put your you can turn it like it's cutting into the uh, wood and run edge of pencil or something up along and you'll see that it kind of just naturally pushes it up along there. That bit is about $89 from Whiteside. There is a one better bit for this and that would be a compression bit which has both the up spiral and a down spiral and it pulls the chips toward the middle of the board but that the one they sell that has two inch cutting length does not have the um, bearing on the end of it so it wouldn't work for me they didn't have any with two inch cutting length like this with bearings on the end so I did not get a compression bit which is probably good because I think that's about 150 bucks to apply handles to my template here I'm using some of the joiner pads and I just am putting one inch screws in there. I had to put some washers on there so they don't go too deep. I didn't really want to go through the half inch template though I know some people will screw uh, all the way through the template into the board since they're going to cut off the back part of the board but I kind of want to save that wood. So I used one inch uh, screws and put a few washers. I think my other pad's a little wider and I might not need the washers, we'll see. On the other piece, I've got some handles already that I'm gonna remove from an old template. I kept this tape to it, which has the center holes for the two screws on the bottom, right here and here. So I'll be screwing up through there for my other handles. Again, this is just an old template. I'm gonna take the handles off and put it, take the handles off and put it on the new one. But it's good to kind of keep little things like this that have the center holes there. Now on this one I took and I hammered, took a hammer and set on top and pounded it down so you could find my holes. I am going to pre-drill it just a little bit and I've never really had much experience with uh, screwing directly into the MDF. And Maybe you can do it without pre-drilling but I'm going to go ahead and pre-drill a little bit. So just pounded it with a hammer once or twice to find my marks and then I'll uh, I'll go ahead and pre-drill it. I have now put my handles on all my templates. I think I like this handle the best. It's got countersunk screws on the side. Um, I first put them oriented long ways, which wasn't very comfortable for my hands, so I think probably perpendicular is a little better. On these, I didn't like them quite as well because I wasn't sure the screws came pretty darn close to going through and I had to bring them up with washers and I'm not sure about the fit on those too well. They did not go through, but this one doesn't even, it's kind of sitting up on one end. Also, I probably would have changed the angle a little bit, maybe a little bit more like this angle, whatever's comfortable for your hands. The third for the returns I'm doing, the straight returns on the side of the gooseneck molding running down the side case, I used some table legs I got for about three bucks or so at the hardware store and some T-bolts. The T-bolts were a pain to deal with. Um, used a Forstner bit to countersink those down and getting it to kind of be the right the right distance not to stick out but is not easy. Plus the other thing I'm a little worried about is when I'm turning it if I counterclockwise I, um, I might unscrew them though they seem to be pretty solid right now. They're not really moving one way or the other but I'm a little worried running it past. So the other thing on these templates is there's just a little bit of overhang on each side so I can catch the router bearing first before I go straight into the piece. And that's kind of all the way around. That's going to be the same on this side too. It's going to have a little bit of overhang on these ends here. So I can start router bearing on the ends there. So make your templates a little bit long so you can go slightly over. Um, when you start there'll be a Again, there'll be like a little corner you want to start your bearing on before you hit the wood. You can see that's pretty rough down there from the bandsaw. So but that's all going to come off shortly. 
I did I did put a mark to line up my template before I double stick taped it one on each corner here to kind of give me an idea of about how to drop it down I dropped down this front corner first onto it before it hit the tape and put the tape along it I'm using the uh, double wide roll of tape for the double stick turners tape right here um, and I'm rubbing real good on the center I don't like to rub the end so I can peel it off still this is about the number of pieces I put on there I thought about maybe I should put them a little further back on the board in case the uh, the residue interferes with the staining but I figure I'll be sanding it enough where to probably take that off though in retrospect I might have put them a little further back from the edge but in any event um, that's about the number I'm using and and I'm using alignments for it so here we go and this double stick turners tape says spec tape s p e c t a b e pressure sensitive tapes I don't know sometimes I get this stuff from woodcraft or I might have got online I'm not quite sure uh, but it holds really well for my setup to flush trim I'm actually using a pin with the up cut spiral bit and I changed my collection system a little bit to put a wood arm coming out which you can't quite see so I'm going to go ahead and flush trim this now. Here we go. Two of the three worked out real nice, but this um, return piece that I'm using, there was divots here in the plywood that I didn't notice, and I could feel when I was running the bearing over them that it was making it irregular and ridged in here. Um, luckily, I've got enough material. I'm actually going to route both ends of this for returns, but I've still got enough material. I'm going to replace this this board here. So I guess the uh, lesson learned there is not to use a cheap piece of plywood with some voids there's one or two on the other side and even this little one I could feel when the router bit went over there I could feel the ridges the uh, vibration through the router um, table through the router feel of it that it was just kind of bumpy when it was coming over there you know if I was only gonna do it one time I'd sand it off and be done with it but the thing is I'm gonna be passing this multiple times over all different profiles so I'm gonna go ahead and I've thought about filling these voids like with wood filler or something and sanding it down but I think I'm just gonna slice off a piece of MDF and and uh, hook it up to there and redo it and cut a little bit shorter I noticed that my jig for my pin router type setup or overhead arm is a little sitting a little high on my workpiece here Right near the edge there so I'm going to raise my table up by just the width of the hardy backer board if you don't already have a uh, table saw sled I would definitely build one it will save you from using a radial arm saw um, I know there's miter saw sl pullouts too sleds but I don't have one of those so anyway I'm going to build up my router table yes I could also trim a little bit off the bottom of this jig 
and bring it back down, but I figured that in the future, sometimes my bits are right in between and I might need a piece of a hardy backer to kind of raise the table up a little bit. My overhead router arm jig to use it seems like it sits a little high for this template. The edge or the lip on this is sitting a little high. So I'm going to raise the table up by using a piece of hardy backer board. I could have just taken the bottom off of this, sliced it off I guess, made it a little thinner, but uh, for future jigs I might want a little higher. I could have put an extra washer in here, then I would have broke the nylon lock washer there. So in order to do the cutouts for the pin and the router bit, I'm going to use old tiling trick. What I did is took, set it up exactly the same size as the, cut the piece the same size as the top, and slid it against the uh, pin here and drew two lines on either side, then took it long ways, set it against the pin, drew another two lines, and then where those intersect, right there with the right angle, that's where I'll drill my hole. Of course, I'll make it a little bigger. Same way for the center chuck here is again just drew two lines there and then take two on the end here and set it up there and then where those intersect I'll cut out use a forcer bit to get a nice clean cut on that and cut out a hole and then I'll set this on top and it'll build it up tall enough to meet my template a little easier. Of course I have to set it, cut out the back to where the overhead router arm is going to sit. So next I'm going to talk about this overhead router pin jig. Um, <clears throat> I built this out of one of the woodworking magazines and used it before and it worked quite well. It's got a dado cut right here. Some people drop down their router, drop it on top and cut it through and try to keep it in the middle. All I did is dado and then put an extra little wood block glued in here to keep it from running out. It's got a few tracks. Again, I probably just ran on the table saw and glued these tracks in behind it. Got it clamped down to the table. Use some bracing blocks right here on top. Some pocket hole screws here. I believe these two are actually glued together. It looked like there was a glue line down there. So it's got a ball bearing. You can get that at any, uh, you know, any big block hardware store. And uh, on top it's got a nylon lock washer and regular washer in it. You can do it with just a piece of wood. Some people just run it run their piece against the wood here instead of having a bearing. I like the bearing, it turns a little easier. It's got a few extra washers and just a screw up through there. It looks like a woodworking screw. It's got a head on it, like a tapered head. I don't know if I can get up under there. So anyway, it's clamped on the back of my router table and you can slide it back and forth on these two tracks and behind and, and then tighten it down. So that gives you a bearing when you have bits that aren't bearings to use. I, somehow I drawn a line here, maybe I used a center finder, a uh, plastic center finder uh, to localize the middle of the wheel and drawn it before I installed it. And I kind of line that up over the top of a small, I went and got a small little one quarter inch uh, shank bit on the smaller ones and used the very top edge of that to try to get it close in line. I don't know if it's that important. It has to be exactly in line. Um, I don't think it does, but uh, it gives me a reference point. It's clamped in now. So each time I make a progressive pass, I can move it back a little bit further and make it a little bit deeper. And I can always move the bit up a little higher too to make progressive passes. So that jig you can find in one of the woodworking magazines. I'm not sure which one I got it out of. There's probably something online that you can find it. And or you can just make your own there. Maybe at the end, if I have time, I'll do some measurements on some of these things because I don't have the original plans anymore for, for making this piece, but you can kind of get an idea of what it is. So I've started the tedious process of hogging out the waste um, from the gooseneck molding. And I started with just this bit there was a lot of different bits I could have used. Sucked it down under the table and just taken about this big a, whoops, this big a pass right now. 
both sides because I'm doing two pieces of return, about eight inches, that'll give me plenty extra. So I drew my pattern on here first, and I'm going to try to hog out as much as I can before I start the final bits, which will kind of be in this order here. Number one is a cove bit, and then I'll move down the row. So this cove bit, you really wouldn't want to take it and try to hog out all that material at once or the board would go spinning out of your hands and probably break your wrist or something. Well, it's an exaggeration, but you get my point. It would be way too much wood to take out. So right now I'm just going to hog out with different various bits. I've got a couple others that I can use if I need to to kind of uh, take a little bit at a time. And it's been pretty smooth the first pass. That amount of material seemed almost too easy. I might take a little more next next pass we'll see. I've also run the other two uh, pieces here at the same time and I will continue to run them all. That's why I did so many handles is because when I get the final passes I want it the exact same height on the router bit and the same pullback on the over overhead router pin um, apparatus so they'll match up and they'll miter at the corners and so they'll look the same. So that's why I went with so many different handles for this. Okay, here I am hogging out the waste. I'll just show you one pass here. It's nothing special. Just put good downward pressure on the board. That's taken out the bulk of the waste around the curve. I have a few points. Uh, one is I probably should have put these handles a little bit further forward toward the front edge for the pressure here. Um, I think that would have been better. Uh, the other handles were fine. These, these, these handles were okay and these handles were fine too right here. So a few other points on the nibbling away process. The uh, passes I took were quite a few. To get to this point, I probably did at least 15 passes. I used two different bits here. I used a shorter one at the very, I'm sorry, shorter one, let me find that one. Shorter one at the very end, and for the majority of about three quarters of the removal of the stock, I used this bigger piece, and I went back at the very end and put it back in there. Some takeaway points. Uh, number one, make sure before Every time you change the bit height and the depth of the stop to check two knobs, check this knob on top, make sure it's really tight, and check this knob right here, make sure that your bit's very tight, you don't want to move it. Do it twice if you need to. It's a good time to have OCD. I really nibbled away at it. I guess that's where you get the nibbler. Took little bits at a time. I got a little too close to the line a few times, but didn't cross over. I took about quarter inch uh, depths depth on this each time. Um, it's not like one big cut across here. No, that was a couple of cuts. That's one of them I came back and cleaned up at the end, putting the big bit back on there. So it's good to take very small cuts. Take your time. Take lots of passes. You don't want to chip out. At one point, about halfway through, I saw this chip come off. And for some reason, where did it? Yeah, right here, this chip, this piece of chip came off the uh, board about halfway through in a panic, thinking, "Oh no, I've crossed over my line," but I was okay. It was, it was probably because I was going against the grain. I did not do any climbing cuts with this thus far. Um, I know that some people will follow the grain, do climbing cuts. I think with a piece as big as these, not necessarily the straight one, but the curved ones, big, hard to handle. That climbing cuts would be very difficult with a piece like that. If you had something smaller, easier to handle, 
it wasn't shaped as oddly as this, then I might do some climb cuts. But so far I've gotten them out with just this one little tear out and it didn't really affect the, uh, the curve. So I'm getting ready to change over to a cove bit to do this part here and I'll sneak up on that too, just like I've been nibbling away at the, all the other pieces here. So double check your knobs, make sure they're really tight. Um, make sure your handles are a little forward on the piece. Really steady downward pressure on the table is very important. I didn't have to push it real hard against the bearing here. This bearing didn't really have to push it that hard against that, but I did have to push really hard against the table to keep it from rising up. So steady downward pressure, small cuts, nibble away, double check the knobs that they're tight. Take your time and do lots of passes. Don't take too much wood at a time. Try to stay on the other side of the line. Would you do a sample piece maybe when you do the first run each time to make sure you don't cross the line? Yeah, that might be a good idea. I was I got away, got pretty close cut there, one on the top of the cove there, but I got away without a sample cut. So I'm gonna use these pieces as a real thing as long as we make it through the rest of it. Well I've finished the cove cut. I did three passes to get to this point. Um, it's very smooth. No hand tools knew it needed. And next I'll move to the rest of the profile. Uh, the nice thing about this Freud bit I noticed is that the edge here is actually set at an angle. I don't know if you can appreciate it. It's not straight down so it's it's going to get a little shearing effect because of that which is, ni which is nice. You don't want your carbide tip straight up and down. You want it a little angled so you can shear off the wood rather than chip out and things. Um, so I took three passes, slowly worked my way up and in a little bit until I got it just right. And now I'll move on to the other profiles. I know one thing I forgot to tell you on the earlier when I had the curve patterns is try to keep them perpendicular on the curve to the center line here. Otherwise, you don't, I don't think you get the full depth of cut. So whenever you change the curve, keep it very perpendicular to this line here. Okay, I've got to show another pass on the router here. I've got an OG bit in there without a ball bearing on the top. And I'm going to put another pass through just to show you that it's not that hard. So a mistake that I realized about two days ago is that on the final cut, everything's been cutting from this direction on the shaper table. The final cut, you flip your piece over and use a bit like this off the base router bearing right there. But in order to do that, the problem is two of my three jigs, I can take the handles off, but not this one. This one is a problem because uh, it's screwed from underneath up through the handle. So I, I was able to get the back screw out because the screw holes behind here but the front screw I'm gonna to have to figure out a way to get out. If what I should have done probably was put the handles on this piece like I had last time. I had it mounted on this piece and then put that on top of the template with double stick tape. And then that way I could have just peeled this off and flipped it upside down. So now I'm in this where I'm gonna run it on the shaper table like this. I guess the question is why am I using a shaper table? It's for visualization. It's superior to doing an overhead router. You could you could do it with hand router and uh, a jig, just upside down kind of jig attached to the router plate, but you're not gonna be able to see as well. You'll see people that do that, that are leaning way down trying to see up under there, whereas the uh, visualization of how much cut, how much wood you're taking is much better on the shaper table. And so now I'm gonna figure out how to get this handle off. I'm probably gonna have to break out a fine multi-master tool to cut through a little piece of wood on the one screw I was able to get the back screw out.
profile once I'm done routing the edges here it's kind of I guess in a vase shaped profile before I cut it out on the bandsaw you know to be sure that you get the right curve in the right outer and upper edge I really clipped the template on a lot of times back and forth and held a piece up held this piece on the edge of it you might want to do a cutout with a paper so you make sure you get the right edge don't go by what I'm doing now um, so I went back and forth back and forth laid it down on my templates before I routed it to make sure I didn't get the wrong curve or the wrong which sides upper and which sides lower so at least do a maybe a little paper cutout like this and attach it to the front of the template board and then and then put it in place multiple times and then lay it down on lay it down on your piece next as far as the um, router bit sequence I changed it a little bit from what I'd done previously and the first cut I did was using this cove bit into this area here now the second cut I tried to take this piece and do this cut but the top edge kind of chipped out right along right along the flat top edge here it chipped out along this corner here so I actually had to come back with a bit I think I used a bigger one than this but and flush trimmed it and made it a little bit higher to take away that chip then I came back and I used this piece but I set it down a little bit so the top didn't hit brought over fairly close and then the third spot I believe the fourth spot that was the third spot okay the fourth spot would be about right here I use this little quarter inch shank bit to get up under there and then the last one I turned it upside down and used the big bit that's on my table currently it's kind of kind of shaped like this one only not quite this big with the bearing on the bottom and kind of turn the template upside down and ran it like that or like that so that was kind of the sequence it varied a little bit as I went it wasn't exactly how I originally planned on the curves and finding the bits this time I've written down the bits for my next time last last time I did this I didn't write down which bits I used and I had a hard time trying to figure out a couple of the, the bits for using it but this time I think I've got it for future records these books right here kind of have help you out uh, Glenn Huey um, I think his is more in depth than the shaping wood by Liney Bird Liney Bird does mostly the routing of the gooseneck portion but more of the case construction and the routing and things are included in here Liney Bird has his own special bit or he used to I don't think it's I don't think you can obtain it anymore where it had one bit that would cut the entire profile it's a big, you know, a big multi-shaped bit taking out a lot of wood at once. But anyway, that would probably be a lot more expensive than just doing your individual bits like this. And there's also an article that might help you for this, and that's from uh, Fine Woodworking Magazine, July-August issue 2012. It has a volume on here too. Let's see. This is page four. 74 down here titled curved moldings on the router table and so that's also useful yeah, they used a different kind of overhead pin arm they used a piece of PVC pipe I kind of like my roller better